Yeah, this presentation is just some first steps of something we are trying to do, uh, addressing so some of the issues that you find when you take a look at the models that are being published and work right now about Neolithic transition about very, very large scale. Um, so the idea here is that there are lots, and when I mean lots is a lot, these are, this is just a small sample of papers that are trying to analyze Neolithic transition, typically in Europe, but also uh, there's something to be uh, there's to be some other uh, applications in other in other uh, parts of the world, taking into account that Neolithic uh, appear independently in different areas of the planet. So the idea here is that by doing this kind of large scale analysis, people is trying to answer questions about uh, how this transition occurred. This transition is probably one of the most important uh, tipping points in the story of humankind. So um, the topics are quite that diverse because you have stuff about if it was a dynamic diffusion, so people moving, or it was not a migration, but it was the ideas, the cultural ideas that moved. Um, think about the rate of dispersal, if this rate is constant or not, uh, the, the origin of uh, everything, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, also, what is the interaction between these new farmers and herders and the people that already lived in the territory, if, if they interact in, and if they live in, in what way, positive, negative, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> the idea here is that um, all this all this research is typically done using a large-scale C14 database, uh, such as the map that you see here, that's more or less the idea. But the thing is that if you take a look at people, I mean the modelers, okay, uh, where they are really happy about talking about the large-scale uh, approach, or people excavating and actually doing the C14 days, you see a lot of debate. Uh, because at some point, the ones that are working at a small scale say yes, but how or 60% or 70% of these C14 days are cracked in the way that they are, they have a very uh, a very large uh, error, they are not the good ones, maybe they were taken a uh, lot of years ago, so if this happens, should be using this, uh, these, um, these days. The answer to that from some other people is that if you use a large enough uh, data, uh, the theory of large numbers apply and then all the errors kind of balance themselves and you get like the average value, which is the one that you're looking for. Uh, this is an example, this is the Euroball project from, led by Stephen Shannon at uh, UCL, where uh, they collected 14,000 days, mostly of non Central and Northern Europe, and from them, the experts on C14 they would say that only 1,000 more or less were like high quality C14 days that should be used for that. While you still have this debate about, yes, but if you are estimating that using 15,000 samples that are not really good, but at the same time, people are saying yes, but applying this theory of large numbers, uh, they balance each other, so, so the error is cancelled, and you have a good estimate. Um, so that's the idea, and what do people do with that? One of the things that you can do is what's called weight from characterization. So the idea here is that you ask, oh, come on. So the idea here is that you, have, you assume that this dispersion is linear, so every year more or less people move the same, the same, at the same speed and cover the same distance. And um, by doing that, you use the C14 median, which is the average value, uh, so the, the center value on the entire probability distribution of a C14 day. And with that, you try to infer two things. The intercept, which would be the date of origin, so where everything started, at the center of the origin, and then the slope, which is the speed. Let me show an example. So imagine here each point if a, a site were um, Neolithic arrived, and you can see here how um, at the beginning here, uh, so at the very, so the x-axis is distance, the y-axis is the date of arrival. So as you move out of the center, it means that you arrive later, because obviously you are moving in this kind of waveform. And the idea is that, yes, you have some error, but the general line is the uh, trend of the entire pattern of dispersion. So you get that. The, uh, so you estimate the speed, and then you also estimate the origin, okay? Um, the issue here is that, I mean, continuing this discussion, yes, you have this waveform, it kind of makes sense, but if you take a look here at all this uh, data, it's not really like that, because obviously you have a lot of diversity, and this diversity means 
that this SSP means that at some point you will arrive later to, or at least in the C14 days, it seems that you arrive later to something that is maybe 200 kilometers uh, closer to the origin. Okay? So you have a lot of noise here, fragmentation, obviously, lots of sites that are not excavated, etc. etc. And if you take a look at the data, that's what you get. So that's not really a line, right? It's kind of, okay, you can more or less see a line uh, here, right? But you have everything else. And that is the issue that a lot of people say this method is not correct because we are creating a model that is too simple and it's not really fitting the data. Moreover, if you know something about C14 days, C14 days are very kind of complex probability distribution. So this is the uh, calibrated C14 curve. That's the one you use, and the median is more or less this value here. But it could, I mean, the time of arrival based on this, on this probability distribution could be 200 years before, 100 years later, and with a good probability. So in the end, using the median is an oversimplification of something that maybe it doesn't make sense. On top of that, depending on uh, the period that you are working, you could have different probability distributions because of things like the Hausstadt plateau. So if this happens, it means that the probability will be much uh, flat, so it will be really flat, and uh, the error increases by a lot. Okay? And if, for example, you are working here in other areas where Neolithic arrived later, you could have a huge effect of the Hausstadt plateau. So the method that is being used for Western Europe may not work very well in other areas. So our research question is about this methodological issue of this uncertainty, what to do with it. Uh, the first one is, if the median is not, or we should move to a method that integrates entire probability distribution of the C14 days. The second one is how the sample size and the error is affecting the quality of our analysis. Because it's like, yes, you can discuss it forever, and maybe we should try to start testing these uh, assumptions and, if, and this idea, and try to see if it makes sense or not, and if we can accept the error that we get from this, uh, from this uh, experiment. And finally, uh, the question is if the, this impact to the error, to the uncertainty, is from some of the all the chronologies or for specific chronologies we should take care of what we do. Um, and here, the idea is that all these questions point towards the idea that we want to uh, create a, a Bayesian framework, which is a different type of statistical framework based on the idea that we are quantifying probabilities instead of saying yes, no, this is exactly the speed 0.8. So by doing that, the idea is that we should be able, by using this model, to integrate the entire probability distribution, inform the model with it, and get a probabilistic outcome that is much more closer to what we really know, instead of suggesting that we really know that 0.8 was the speed of the, of the well drum. So um, what we did is we started, instead of using real data, we started with virtual data, but this data we, we generate, so we know exactly what happened, and we can compare the results of these models against the virtual data that we generated. And in this case, uh, that was what we did, two different origins, one that is like the typical Neolithic origin for Eastern Europe, the other one which would be uh, 3000 that is affected by the plateau, and then uh, the speed should be constant, and we assign different errors to the C14 dates, and also different uh, sample size and a uh, very large number of runs, 400 uh, for each of these configurations. So for every single configuration of origin with error with a number of sites, we run it 400 times and to a total of 24,000. Um, so once we simulate the Neolithic dispersal process, what we get is uh, these data variables that are real. So we back calibrate and calibrate again the data. Okay, so instead of having the real data, what we have is the calibrated data. And finally, we apply the model to this data, which in this step would be exactly what would you do if you get real data instead of the data we, uh, we simulated. And for that, we use three different models, the classic model using the mediums, then the Bayesian model that we, uh, we created, and finally the direct, which is the baseline. That this is based not in the calibrated data, but in the real data, so this is the real real deal, the, the thing that the other ones should try to uh, identify. These are some of the results. This is just one of the 400 uh, runs that we did. You can see that the x-axis here uh, is the uh, error. So as you increase, you move right, you have more error. And instead of a straight line, it begins to be like a cloud of points. And the y-axis is the number of sites. So uh, again, as you increase, you have more and more sites, so that's more or less what you get. So again, we did that 400 times, and the idea here is to get the result of that and see what they look like. 
These are the uh, ranges for the estimation of the speed when we are using this origin of 7,000 BB. And uh, as you can see here, each of the plots, 1, 15, 25, it's um, the error that we accept on our data. And then uh, x-axis here is the number of sites, and y-axis is the speed. Um, as, you, as I said, the direct, uh, the direct estimation is the baseline. It's the, the one used in the data we use to generate the C14 dates. So the green one is the one that the other one should try to uh, should, should try to uh, identify. The red red thing one is the Bayesian one, and the blue one is the classical one that everyone is using. Uh, what we can see here is that when the error is very low um, and the sample size is also quite low, the classic model does not work very well. As you can see here, it's quite uh, the box plot. It has quite a, a very wide uh, value for variance, while the Bayesian model works quite better. Uh, but as we increase error, you can re uh, see how the, the two models kind of balance each other because the uh, classic model is always more or less the same, but the other one, as you increase error, has more error, and this error generates a, a worse uh, estimate. In any case, one thing that we found quite interesting is that the bias that we see is quite consistent. So if you can see the blue box plot, they are the, the median, which is the uh, horizontal line, is consistently below the uh, classic, the, the real data, the green box plot, which is something that it's kind of, okay, so it means that every single uh, study doing that, they are giving a value that is slightly uh, higher than it should be, because as you can see here, the bias is quite consistent. If we take a look at the um, origin, it's more or less the same. We can see here how, as we increase the number of sites, um, the, let's say, the, uh, error, the error of the model decreases, makes sense because what you are saying is that you are giving more information to estimate this linear relation and as you give more information your error uh, decreases which is good and then uh, at the same time as you increase the error everything kind of balances out but when you have a, um, uh, when you have a, a, an error that is quite low it's quite good because the Bayesian model is performing quite better than the other one. Um, this is for 7,000. If we take a look at the one affected by the hashtag plateau, things get more interesting because as you can see here, especially when the error is very low, the classic model consistently gets a wrong value. It's not super distant from the real value, but in any case, it's also consistent and it's quite important, especially if you consider it to the Bayesian model. That makes sense because with the hashtag plateau in the middle, the error of the C14 date is higher, meaning that the median value is quite out of what it should be. Um, so if you compare that to the Bayesian model that is actually using the entire probability distribution, this one, uh, even with the half of plateau in the middle, is performing quite well and is identifying the values that it should be if you compare it with the uh, green box, which is the baseline. Um, again, more or less, the, the pattern is the same one when you increase error or uh, when you create error, everything kind of bounces out, but again, and I think that's also why consistent is that all the bias are always the same. So if it's below or higher than the median of the green box, it's always this way in all the cases. Finally, for the origin, uh, you get the same thing, um, which is also quite uh, interesting. When, when you have errors that are quite high, the difference could be up to a hundredth of a century. So it's not amazing in terms of, it's not that you are uh, wrong by a thousand years, which yeah, we probably could have noticed that before, uh, but it means also that um, the, these errors can be quite important because they kind of relate to each other. If you have a higher speed, it means, so if you estimate the speed wrong but uh, consistently higher, it means that the origin will be also uh, lower and the other way around. So both of them are kind of related together and um, the consequence as well is that if you have good C14 days for the origins that you know of Neolithic, then you would be able to improve your understanding of the uh, speed. So to summarize, the idea here is that uh, the classic approach uh, in this assessment works quite well for what it is in the sense that it's, it, uh, using the median is a huge simplification of a very complex probability distribution. And despite of that, if you have a decent sample size, uh, it works quite well if generally the error is high. And this is archaeology, so the error and the uncertainty will always be high. So uh, that's the type of data we have, right? Uh, so th this is one. But what I think is interesting is that if we use these medians, 
we are quite, uh, so the, the error and the uncertainty affects us a lot. Okay, so depending on the sample size and, the, and this error, and in this case, uh, it's a virtual data set, so everything is very well taken care of and we know exactly everything what's going on. So imagine the uncertainty that you get on sample size and error in the real world in, with using real C14 dates, where uh, on top of that you have biases about intensity bias or different countries having different policies on C14 dates, different budgets, etc. So I think it's very interesting that using the median, yes, it was more or less well, but the issue here is that we are not really sure what's going on at the level of uh, real evidence, but at least what we know is that it's quite sensitive to these two specific things, uh, which is not a good, uh, a good uh, thing. Um, the, the third thing which we believe is quite interesting is this consistent bias, because if this bias is consistent, it makes sense because the calibration curve is not changing every time we calibrate. Uh, what can happen is that we could actually rectify uh, we could rectify what we are doing. So if we estimate something using the median, and we know exactly what is based on the origin and the region of the calibration curve that the C14 is using, and C14 that is using, we could potentially consistently rectify the values to be more correct, because we already know what is the bias that you will have if you use the median in a specific uh, um, section of the calibration curve. So I think that that's a quite interesting result that probably should be followed by some kind of analysis of what is exactly this, um, this, um, this error, this consistent bias, in order to rectify the estimates. And finally, we think that this Bayesian approach seems more, much more efficient, not because it gives better results, that typically it does, but especially because it's quite uh, robust to changes in sample size and error, which makes it quite reliable if you move from, now that we will try to move from virtual data sets to real evidence uh, using these thousands of C14 dates that we have. So to, uh, to uh, conclude, yeah, this, this next step, that is where we are interested to go. So now that we got a decent idea of what are the biases in our data, what is the uncertainty and the error that we are accumulating by using this, uh, this classical model, the idea here is, what if we start introducing the critics that most are, lots of archaeologists that are not modelers are doing against this type of model. The first one is quite obvious, is that what if it's not a linear process? So why are we using a linear regression if it's not a linear process? This, this is a bad fit. Yes, we'll get some results, but uh, if you move from the very general interpretation, you will always get it wrong. For example, one thing that uh, what we want to do is to add heterogeneous environments, so get some ideas about the landscape where they are migrating, and based on that, try to um, inform the, the model. And using a Bayesian approach will be quite interesting because you can create what's called a hierarchical model. And in this case, the speed and uh, the speed would be a variable that is not fixed, but it will be uh, modified by a higher model. That's why it's hierarchical, uh, where what you are doing is estimating, for example, the mobility and connectivity of the landscape where uh, people is moving. The other thing that we want to do is something that came up during the process and it's like, okay, so you say that it's linear and they constantly move at the same place, but as you disperse, the area that you cover is increasing, right? Because you move from the center. Oh, oh, okay. You move from the center towards the railing, right? So as you do that, the wave front increases on, on uh, dimension because it's higher, it's uh, larger than previous. So what does it really mean that it's uh, that it's a constant speed? Because you are increasing that, meaning that in our hypothesis is that the cultural diversity of the people moving, they are more people moving in a wider territory. So what if this cultural diversity is increasing over time and how would this affect that? Because if people have different preferences on where they want to live, uh, if they are, every year they are covering exactly the same territory, that's one thing. But if uh, it, that's not happening and they are increasing the, the distance between the wavefront, between the people that is the wavefront, then it means that the impact on the final result will be much, much higher. So that's something that we want to analyze as well. And finally, the other issue that we want to do is what if based on that and based on this analysis, what we can do is to say, oh, from these 14,000 dates, 16,000 of them, these ones here are the ones that we will be using because based on that, these are the ones that are not affecting hugely the result. And in this way, it's kind of a feedback loop where you are informing the choice of uh, the C14 dates that you will want to use based on the bias that, and the uncertainty that you see
that these samples are uh, generated into 